So at the core, community members tasked us with this idea of tackling the, the concept of food sovereignty, which we define as livelihood plus self-determination. So it's not just enough to grow food, right? But it's also another thing to, to use sustainable agriculture as a medium to actually create sustainable, well-paying jobs for folks. So we partnered with numerous um, partner organizations, and we took a five-step model in our, in our organizing. So the first step is we actually organized community members, and, and the second step is training them. So one of the things that we did was folks that needed jobs, we, we had a community forums, focus groups to figure out, okay, what does the economic impact of the economic need look like in our community, and how do we actually filter out who gets to go first? Um, so in the beginning, we had 15 community members that started with us um, to pioneer uh, what aquaponics looks like in our community. So the second aspect is training. So since a lot of our folks um, in our community are actually of an immigrant background, so most Vietnamese and Latino, um, we had to take a creative approach. It's not just, you know, we can't just have a lecture style uh, sort of pedagogy, but rather we had to combine something that was lecture style and hands on. Um, and that required our staff to get trained. So, we actually went to Hawaii, um, we went to parts of California and um, the East Coast to actually learn about how different folks and different communities were actually applying aquaculture and aquaponics and hydroponics in their communities. And what we actually settled with was land-based aquaponics using a deep water grass system. So this is actually a picture of our first training group. We actually trained in the other communities in styles of aquaponics. <coughs> And leading from training is actually incubation. So our community has, um, like speakers this morning said, a, a traditionally um, difficult time of accessing capital or assets. So what that means is folks couldn't actually pay for things up hand or actually access large tracts of land or, or capital finance and occupying system of farms. Or even because land access wasn't available, period, large scale in our agriculture also was not an option. So actually what we started to do was, okay, we said, okay, everyone actually has Burgers that we lost, and so you can see here the more of like an empty lot. It's kind of hard to see the scale of so the snapshot into a growing system. And what we did is we actually built grants to actually finance the growers with micro grants. This is something that's very different from a loan, where loans we actually kind of can create um, almost like a tenant farmer situation where I mean, this was this was a micro grant where they didn't have to pay anything back. So we actually incubated initially the growth system to that growth. So you can actually see this is a frame of the greenhouse, plus you can start to see the idea of deep water systems, or a deep water wrap system. So this is more of a small scale picture. This is actually a training facility that we built outside of a uh, business complex. It's a very small one, so we just got uh, a very small glimpse of what occupying, what growing community and urban environment would look like. Kind of a better idea of what a finished water reflects looks like for a small uh, rack system and with everything growing in it. Um, so different types of, you can see, density for lettuce. You do all types of things from herbs um, to things in the algae family to tomatoes to sugar plants to um, taro, which is like a root plant, um, cucumbers, strawberries. So actually almost anything grows in the aquaponics system. And we also raised uh, Hybrid striped bass uh, and koi, in particular, for our application. So this was good, and then this is what we consider phase one. So phase one was us testing the water with background, um, with backyard uh, aquaponics or small scale, lot scale aquaponics, and we were using aquaponics to grow food not only for corner stores but to sell to high end restaurants. We were growing actually microgreens, herbs, lettuce, um, and other types of. Uh, various produce for restaurants actually pay the growers and increase food access in that community. So phase two actually started when we got larger tracts of land. So this is actually um, a four acre site. It's hard to see the scale. This is four acre scale, half of the four acres. This is about 1.5 of, uh, of the four acres. Um, and one of the things that we realized actually was that while aquaponics is great in an urban setting with you know cement and it actually was not feasible to do like three or four scale or three or four acre scale type systems. One of the biggest reasons is because the actual cost of, of upfront capital. For example, if you notice in all these pictures, well, I don't think it's 
kind of hard to get this, but everything is built on cement. Um, except for this. This was the one exception. Um, but we learned that aquaponics costs over quadruple per square foot to incubate than an in in-ground agricultural system where you can actually just work the land. Um, so what we decided to do instead was we were going to do in-ground agriculture but complemented with aquaponics. So um, for those who are involved in in-ground agriculture, you know, fish emulsion is, is money. So essentially we can actually use the fish waste from aquaponics systems to help fertilize our in-ground agriculture. Um, so essentially we built an in-ground agricultural farm, actually scaling much larger than any of our aquaponics systems. And this is great because as a central site, it allows us to engage community members in a, in, a, in a more wide form than just engaging maybe a handful in the actual growing cell itself. So we're actually able to engage a larger portion of our community in, um, in such as community sport compost. So this is actually a picture of a community member dumping their uh, kitchen scraps into, our, into compost piles. Um, we were able to engage local uh, youth. Um, so, pictures of youth going to our farm, actually even leading to employing some of the youth on our farm itself. Um, so like I said, there were three, there are five steps, and I talked about the three steps is organizing, training, and incubating growers, and the fourth step is marketing and distribution and sales. Um, so as a, as a farmer's co-op, we were adhering strongly to organic and heirloom principles, so where possible we grow organic and at all time, or no, where possible we grow heirloom varieties of crops, and at all times we grow according to organic practices. Um, this is some types of beans that we grow, dragon's tongue beans, which are just an heirloom variety. And definitely one of our strong points was as a co-op, we were able to bring together growers that would have been competing with each other for the same markets and actually market as one brand. And this is actually an interesting example because it even works on the flip side. So where, whereas most buyers never actually go, they're actually seen once, they never actually visit farms, right? And have a chance to meet growers. We were actually, to, we were actually able to bring buyers, so this is actually a round table buyers who can meet growers. To say, okay, these are things that we currently use on our menu, um, then the growers are able to have a dialogue back and say, well, these are things that we're well in these are these are things that we'd like to grow, these are things that we need to grow, and actually strike a middle ground where chefs are actually catering their produce <coughs> and what's being grown locally. Um, so that actually leads to restaurant sales. Restaurant sales are great for us because it actually provides us the economic backing for our organization. We sell the grocery stores, um, we also sell farmers markets, and CSA boxes. Um, and more importantly, we realized that, you know, making money was only one part of the, the equation. The other part was how do we actually have positive social impact and how do we increase food access in our local community. And it, for us, it went beyond just providing corner stores with, uh, with greens or, or with healthy clothes because of a lot of our folks, um, we need to we need to have a holistic approach to food access. So one of the things that we did is we actually partnered with a community health clinic and actually did healthy cooking demonstrations and talked to other community members how to, how to do Hair, um, traditional cuisine that was also healthy at the same time. So this is actually a picture of a Vietnamese salad that a community member prepared to teach other community members how to do the same thing that's also diabetic friendly, hypertension friendly, and, and hyperlipidemic friendly, which were kind of a lot of public health issues plaguing our community still. And then we also held block parties. Um, so we had lots of music, a lot of young people doing poetry, but also as a venue to sell produce. This is why the success And the final and last step of our thought process, which is the most important part, is reinvesting back into our community growth. So, most for, if anyone here is a commercial grower, y'all know that distribution takes a huge cut. Um, because we do everything in house, we actually do the marketing, distribution, sales, completely in house. Growers actually get 80% of all revenue back, so 80 cents on every dollar. Um, and because we're a co op and we're actually negotiating straight with buyers, um, the growers who were actually being agriculture before, they said that some types of products are actually going to pay 10 times more than what they were going through other distribution channels. So this is something that's a really important lesson that we learned is the, the value of the cooperative system in terms of uh, financial value back to the grower themselves. So in short, we've been in operations since 2010. Since then, we've been able to actually create 14 growers. We graduated four summer youth. Um, we're working with 14 young people now. Because of the demand. Um, 
We've been doing some we graduated two classes of healthy eating, eating demonstrations of what we do is a, a lay health worker model. We can go into more detail with any of the questions. We actually added on both in soy milk distribution. Um, and we also do a regular CSA box. And some of the lessons learned that I think are really key um, to our success, um, or at least that we've learned in the past four years, one is the importance of engaging young people and the importance of community organizing. So I think because of our mission is not just to make money, but it's also to grow food to have a positive uh, community impact, it was very important for us to be based in the community um, and to have community support. And with that, we were able to do things such as like cooking demonstrations, block parties, or community support, composting programs, or youth projects. Um, and that wouldn't have been possible without community support. The other thing is to address food access holistically. So we, when talking with community members, it wasn't just enough to say, hey, we're going to stop corner stores and lettuce. Well, maybe they said, you know, you have to teach us, like, why is lettuce more healthy than, say, you know, honey buns? Or, like, you know, what is the context in which it exists, in which all of these public health issues um, exist for us? And so linking this idea of eating healthy with history and with community context was really important for a lot of folks, whether young or old. Um, you know, why do our folks not have access to land traditionally? Um, I think that was really, really important for folks to see in context. Because it's not just like your health at, at stake, but historically, you know, it's, it's empowering to eat healthy. Um, and also having a DIY mindset. This was really important, not only for India and agriculture, but folks who are interested in aquaponics. Um, when we started off, um, we were buying filters that were probably like running two to three thousand dollars each um, from the local engineering firm. We actually over the years, this is impossible to keep up the, the you know, purchasing when it breaks down or maintaining it. So we actually figured out a way to engineer that ourselves, or instead of hiring engineers to build off the mine systems, we can kind of engineer it ourselves. And that cut down costs tremendously, um, if that makes sense. So for example, it's from everything from filters to, to fish tanks to feed, just learning how to create everything yourself significantly cuts down the start of costs. So that was my presentation in a nutshell. Basically, I can see any questions or talk more about aquaponics or anything that we did or, or presented about if folks have any questions or points of clarification. I'd love to hear more about aquaponics. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a lot of sneaky. So, I'll go more into detail about the aquaponics piece. Specifically, um, so in 2010, we started with aquaponics um, as a launching ground, mostly because we were working with areas with concrete, so we were left with no choice but to figure out a way to build on concrete. Um, so when we initially did the research, we went to Hawaii, we went to Oakland. Um, there's a local spot in the Walls that was doing straight aquaculture. So for folks who are not familiar, aquaponics is a combination of two terms. Aquaculture, which is the artificial rearing of fish, and hydroponics, which is essentially soil this out of agriculture. Um, so it's a combination of the two. So hydroponics actually uses um, fertilizers and actually mixes it into the water to feed past the roots of the plants. Whereas aquaponics uses the, plant, uh, the, the fish themselves as a source of fertilizer. Um, so essentially, the goal of aquaponics is to create a symbiotic um, environment. So what it is, is fish create waste. And if there's a large enough buildup of that waste, and specifically I'm talking about nitrates. Nitrates is a, a plant soluble or usable form of nitrogen. There's enough of a build that the fish actually can't survive. So the plants actually filter out the water and it filters back to the fish as clean water, if that makes sense. So without the fish, the plants can't survive, and without the plants, the fish can't survive. What we were learning, there's many different techniques that we experimented with. Um, we ended up with a deep water raft system. There's a couple other um, systems that we experimented with. One was aeroponics, which folks may traditionally see as like a huge tower of like little cups hanging out of the side and actually just like plants growing in a column form. Um, NFT, which is the nutrient flow through system, which is more of the rain gutter style system which we, we tested to, where instead of plants sitting in water, so you can imagine this is actually, you can see this right here, the plants are sitting in about a foot and a half of water at all times. Whereas in a nutrient flow through system, you're actually shooting a very thin stream of water through without really an inch or two deep at any given time. Um, so we experimented with, experimented with that in a tiered system. So NFT sometimes is seen in a flat bed where you have long rows of these gutters 
going across. But in a tiered system, it works really well for strawberries, which is what we actually used it for. Because instead of having these flat um, rows like this, we actually think of like a ladder where you have rungs and it's on about a 45 degree incline. And you pump water to the top and it trickles all the way down to these gutters that are steered, um, that are tiered so they can all get sunlight. And it's really good for, for things like strawberries, which are running going on. So we learned all these different types of techniques and in the actual application <coughs> itself, we found that deep water raft systems were easiest to maintain. So um, yeah, definitely by far the easiest to maintain and to set up. Um, the only issue um, with deep water raft systems is you need to aerate the water. Um, so things such as MMT systems or, or aeroponics, because you're shooting a thin stream of water through the, the roots of the plants, and most of the root is still intact with, the, with air, you don't need to have a way to aerate the water as opposed to um, root system. So I guess stepping, um, stepping back a little, there are a couple things in aquaponics that everyone has to kind of consider. Um, one is raising fish. So with fish, you need to have water quality, you need to have air, you need to have feed, you need to have right temperature, pH, um, along with a couple other things. But with plants, what folks don't understand is it's not the same <coughs> soil that raises the plants, but it's actually the nutrients in the soil that raises the plants. Um, so with the plants, you need to have a way to aerate the roots, because just like in soil-based agriculture, your soil is not, it's too compact and you're not getting enough air through the roots, plants just don't grow very well. You also need to the correct pH. You need to have some way to give sunlight, right temperature, and nutrients. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by deep water systems. You need a way to aerate roots, because you're sitting, you're basically using plastic, or styrofoam boards to sink Completely in water. So if you imagine like putting a fully grown basil plant with roots like this long into a cup of water, that's essentially what you're doing. But the difference is the reason why those plants die after a few days in your house, or say that you do that with um, with a cilantro plant, is because it's not getting any oxygen. Um, so that was one of the things that we, we decided was a trade-off that was worth having in a deep water raft system. Um, and specifically with fish too, uh, with with Louisiana, there was a couple things that we miscalculated at the beginning. So, folks in like California and Hawaii and things like that said, oh, you can just leave um, the fish inside the greenhouse. Plus, it's, it's really hot and humid in uh, Louisiana. So, actually, when we first started, so this was this picture of koi that we had inside the greenhouse. We also had a tank of bluegill right next to that. During the summertime, they actually, it, was, it basically became soup. It's so hot inside of the greenhouse that you actually cook all the fish alive. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely one thing. So I advise anybody who starts off, like save yourself the trouble. We had a hell of a day on Memorial Day cleaning out your fish. But it's always to have the fish tank separately. There's also another reason why it's also an allergy. If you're growing, if you're raising things such as hydrostatic acid, and not fond of feeders of allergy. Um, if you're doing things such as grass carp, some types of catfish may, especially grass carp, are more gill feeders or, or, or large head, or yeah, certain types of bass. Then having an algae is fine, but one of the biggest things in, in the greenhouse one is overheating the fish, and two is the algae component. Um, algae take, lowers your dissolved oxygen level, and when you lower dissolved oxygen level, fish can't breathe as well, especially during the summertime when the actual exchange of oxygen between water and air is so high that you really need to have a high level of DO for the, the concentrations that you're, you're raising fish in. So one of the things I would definitely advise is to have your fish house completely separate and completely enclosed. So that's one thing that we did, you know, that could save you from having a like, peanut dead fish with cats, and coons, anything like that as well. Um, the other thing is, I'm definitely just experiment um, with what works best with you. For us, it made sense to make medium. So some folks use, um, the uh, hydroton, which is um, these clay balls that you put in instead of this cocoa bar mix. So we actually use um, about a 60-40 mix, 60% um, cocoa fiber, which is basically uh, coconut fiber. And so they take the, the husk of coconut and grind it down, and they mix in um, vermiculite and uh, perlite to basically make sure that there's water retention in the mix and also aeration. So sometimes if you use just cocoa fiber, and it soaks in the water, there's not enough aeration in that room, and it becomes waterlogged, it's not good for the plants. Um, yeah. Another thing too, yeah, in terms of 
anyone who's interested in building their own filter, we definitely have some tips on that too. So we used to do a bubble bead filter. So a bubble bead filter is basically a pressurized vessel um, with a lot of beads in it, and they shoot the water up through the beads, and it comes out um, as, as basically clear water. It gets down to about, I think my filter's down to about 15, 20 microns, which is pretty good. Um, and you're able to flush it every once in a while. The problem is, the flushing part is still maintenance, and it's not a fun job. Flushing, if you've ever smelled fish manure in concentration, it's not fun. Um, that's one. Two, after, because it's a, usually sold as plastic vessels, over a period of time, especially if you're exposing it to the elements, it will break. And because it's pressurized when it breaks, it explodes. So it's actually a ticking time bomb. So what we did actually, we... A poop bomb. Yeah, essentially a poop bomb. There's a couple things that we did to, to remedy some of the situations. So we were like, okay, so flushing the system is kind of nasty work. So we actually inoculated our systems. So our growers actually, some of them were fishing in, in Vietnam. What they realized was, okay, in Vietnam is actually small, small shrimp to actually clean your boats. Not on purpose, but just something that exists in environments. We did research and found that it's called gammers, gammers and future boards. Future boards being anything that eats like waste matter from other plants or from other organisms such as earthworms. So they're essentially your aquatic earthworms. So gammers are very, very tiny shrimp. You can buy them from most labs will sell them in like maybe 500 count quantities for maybe $50. And that's all you need. So we inoculated our system with gammers. What happened is they cleaned our filter completely. So these engineers were like, how come we don't flush your stuff anymore? Because they used to follow up with us and say, like, how does your filter work? It's so great, we don't flush it anymore. And they're like, you're crazy, it's gonna blow up. And I was like, well, we turned on the back valve and it came out clear. The only thing that came out was all these little tiny shrimp. So the shrimp actually we inoculated the filter will save you the work of back flushing. So all of our filters that we build ourselves, we just have a back flush just in case, but we never back flush anymore. And it's great because it's a, it's a self-controlling mechanism because if there's too many gammas, they, they eventually flow through the filter into the water tanks where fish will eat them anyways until the population is controlled where the, the waste equals the amount of gammas. Once it's done. Yeah, once it's done, it's basically, yeah, fish, especially these hydrostatic bass, love gammas. Koi, not so much, but things such as uh, bluegill, um, tilapia, they all love gammas. Um, the other thing too is once our, our filter blew up, we scrapped it. It was like, cost of me. The smallest one was $1,500. The large scale ones that we're using were like three to 4000 And that's excluding the medium material, which is the actual beads themselves. It actually cost about $200 to fill one up. Um, so we actually built one taking a, if you all have access to 55 gallon rain barrels, what we did, we actually took um, the idea of water filtration from the EPA. So EPA uses a sand gradient filter to filter out water. And when the way it works is we, we shot water through, we had three gradients of sand. Large, small river pebbles, and then really fine sand. And we shot water through that and let it trickle up at a, small, at a slower rate than, in, than a pressurized system. And it still worked. It didn't create a time bomb, and you can still inoculate, inoculate it with, um, with gammas. So that's the, the system that we built. So as opposed to the, like a $4,000 or $1,500 culture, we actually built it for less than $200. Mm -hmm. um, and that's assuming that we gave the, the, the main barrel. Um, so that actually cost us maybe $75 to build. Um, so that's the idea of like, do it yourself or rely on someone else to do it. It makes aquaponics the, the, the difference between affordable and just like astronomically expensive. So for example, um, that's not what you do it yourself, it's better anyway. Exactly. So this is also another example. Um, these fish tanks are all about, the, the cheapest one is maybe like $200, dollars we actually start, started using IVC totes that we got that for about $25. And they actually hold up to 330 gallons of water. Um, they're all lined with like a metal cage. And we already have the, the piping line at the bottom. You just have to make sure it cleaned out really well. So that's another example um, DIY, which we have to cost tremendously. The other thing, too, is just to engineer your system to, to run off of one pump. It's another thing that I would definitely recommend. So a lot of engineers, because they're using pressurized systems, have to use multiple water pumps to maintain pressure of their systems. And it's really, we started out with that to, mean, to, to measure flow rates coming from different angles of the system, which is too much of a game. So we actually most things to be um, gravity fed. And what that means is, 
So if you look at this system, this was designed by the engineer for us, but he just thought it was ridiculous. So you have a water pump right here that pumps back to the fish tank. You also have another pump that pumps through a filter. Um, and then another pump that pumps it up on the, to the NFT system, which flows out here. So we have three water pumps. And every day we're solving some sort of an overflow or, or, or drought. And they couldn't really figure it out how to like, you know, because with a ball valve, there's only so much you can turn to, to, to control the water flow. So we actually, from now on, essentially, um, So after that we scrapped it, we decided, well, gravity flow works just as fine. So when you see, this is like a picture of a pipe coming out of a, of a trough of ours. And instead of using pumps, we actually use 90 degree elbows of, of um, PVC to maintain water level. So it's a little bit harder to, to explain, but for those who are the stand pipers, the stand pipe controls the level of water, so the height of the stand pipe is So we did that with all the pumps, they were all ground fed to each other. All we need is one pipe that comes back to fish tanks, so we're elevated slightly higher than troughs. If that makes sense. So that's definitely another recommendation that we make. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's a little like that's okay to put that part of the magic thing. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't recommend that as well. And also, if you're thinking 
about like fingerling feet too. So fingerlings are basically baby fish. Most people will sell little fingerling feet as well. Another thing we rely on is just mash them up and that's fingerling feet. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Say the name of the black fly slowly. Black, black soldier fly? Soldier. Yeah, soldier like an army soldier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they usually, if you're in the south, you should be able to find them. So what we did one time, we ran out of them, or we needed more, we actually just went to go fish and threw the fish onto a, someone's like, into the back of one of our systems, and the soldier flies just came. Um, it's the, yeah, it's insane. So you, so you uh, basically invaded the soldier flies with uh, fish carcasses and then harvested them? Yeah, so the thing is, you have to harvest the flies themselves, because the flies are the actual ones that lay the, the larva. So all of our soldier fly systems have nets all around them, so the soldier flies have to come back to lay the, the eggs. Yeah, I've had some soldier flies in my head dead animals before I got my roof fixed. Yeah. That's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, the floating. Slow, and you can grab them from the hand. Yeah, you can grab them from the hand and swat them right out of the sky. Yeah. So, yeah, we just we, we had a week in hours and we didn't have to worry about them flying away. So, we just went around with little plastic cups and we just rounded them all up in a little big red truck and threw them back in the system. But, any other questions? How big are these um, the bins you're using to compost with these ultra flies? So, yeah, can you describe this? Yeah, so it's an 8x10. <coughs> 8 by 10 is the largest. Yeah, by, oh, by, oh, by about three and a half feet. Okay, so it's a good size bin. It's a good size bin. You can actually, we, yeah, we start out with a five gallon bucket to, to, to inoculate our first systems. Um, you can do just a 55 gallon drum. So, what I've seen the community members do is they will actually cut a 55 gallon drum in half, lay it on an incline. And then just have the solar flies like that. Or even you don't have to, if I had to do that, I really drive down the drum. It's not even cutting half. I don't know why they do that. It's a lot of work. It's just get the ones without the lid on it and just lay it on an incline. You know, so you throw the food at the bottom and the solar flies will come up and then put a little rain gutter and they'll just fall right in. Um, really, 8 by 10 is almost overkill because we were throwing it, we had like 12 people throwing. Like their their household waste in there. You could like pizzas, burgers, crawfish, <laughs> like gumbo, everything. They ate everything. It's, it's, and they couldn't, yeah, the 8x10 is just overkill in size. I think the 55 gallon drum would do. Um, the biggest concern is definitely wintertime because you don't want to keep throwing in food to have it rot <laughs> during wintertime. But during summertime, they, just, they go through almost everything. Um, yeah, it's actually crazy. They go through bread. We had a, we had so, a, we have like about a three, Wintertime, what's the, what's the temperature range for the soldier flies? What we found is once the dip's below about 60, they start to just not do very well in terms of the, the larva will just stop moving. They just start to like, hibernate or go dormant at it. What do you do with them during the off season? You know, when you get, you know, in other words, when, it's, when the weather warms up again, you gotta go randomly warm no. soldier flies? Or? That's what we thought with. So that's what we initially did, we thought they all died, but actually what it seems like is they go dormant. So this year, for example, we unintentionally found out that they went dormant in more places than we had imagined. They just, you throw in, so one of the things that we love to feed them is um, coffee ground and soybean castings to get them started. Um, so we threw the soybean castings in there and the next day we came out and it was basically done. Um, the soda flies will just like, the water will start to pick up Two other farmers or 
farming groups outside of our own property. Um, so the idea is we're, we're based primarily in New Orleans East. So that's the area that we really focus on in terms of like community benefits. And then we also sell to the, the, the restaurant scene and the grocery store. And to be honest, the market's so big where we're not really afraid of being like competition, I guess. Like it's, it's, so I think it's more of like whether folks are willing to collaborate. So I don't know about other states, but I think New Orleans has like a deep history of politics um, and like board-based politics. Mm -hmm. So you know, like or might get along with people in the east or things like that. We even like this idea of the nonprofit sector. So one of the things that we we're finding is nonprofit money for sustainable agriculture, even urban agriculture, urban farming is very little. So there, therefore there's very little incentive for nonprofits to collaborate. That means cutting down your, your own budget. Um, so that was our biggest barrier, the biggest barrier we still face. So actually what we found out is instead of working with like most nonprofit style urban farming organizations, we started collaborating with LLC or private enterprise um, farmers who didn't have to compete for grant funding, but rather it's like, okay, we get down with the whole collective distribution marketing or positive social benefits, so let's collaborate on that and not have to worry about like, the, the nonprofit bureaucracy side. So I think that's, it's a complicated answer, but the idea is we're always open to sharing knowledge. Um, it's just like getting people to the table is the difficult part, especially when people, especially now with like financial downturn and whatnot, it's really difficult as nonprofits to stay solvent. So we're lucky as a social enterprise um, that's incubated from a nonprofit that we are not tied so much to those same constraints, if that makes sense. Um, Right now it's about 
pushing over 150,000 a year, which is not like tremendous, but yeah, it's it's enough to, to provide jobs for folks. And for a portion of that 150,000 dollars is your overall budget at the time. So for our organization, like I said before, we we only keep 20 percent to go to cover marketing or overhead things like that. 80 percent goes directly back to the, all the humans who participate. Um, so for example, we actually had someone who was in the voice instruction industry, which is really hard work, and we actually doubled their income from this produce sales. So that's the kind of impact we're trying to have on the members. Um, but yeah, only 20% of that goes back to our organizational budget itself. Um, so that's really like, what, 30,000? Um, so that covers things like cooperative fees, um, such as, you know, we have one group of people that we share amongst all the voters. So those that that means fuel, branding, and then also delivery driver costs. Yeah, I have a business card.